All right, Mark Yusko, welcome to the Polling Focus podcast. No, thanks for having me. Great to be here in person, and uh, nice to do it face to face instead of Zoom to Zoom. So yeah, same. I know we were just talking. Uh, both of us are sick of Zoom calls, so it is nice to do this in person. Um, so before we get started, happy belated birthday! Ah, thank you, thank you. I just had the big one. Yeah, six zero. So. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Still still killing it at sixty, right? Well, I, you know, part the only thing the only time I feel sixty. It's when I see a mirror, right? Because I, I, don't, I don't think that I'm 60. I don't hang out with other 60-year-olds. I, I hang out with young people in the digital space. Um, I have a 12-year-old, so, you know, it keeps me young. But, but when I look in the mirror, I'm like, yeah, that dude's 60. So. <laughs> well, first things first, before we get started, can we do an in-person soccer deal today? Sure, sure. Um, I, have to, I guess I have to climb up on the chair. But, uh, so I got the, the green candle pants on, but I have the, uh, the Bitcoin moon uh, socks on today, so I do always have my Bitcoin socks on. Although sometimes I wear the on-chain monkey socks these days, but uh, got the Bitcoin moon on today. Although we're far from the moon, as we'll talk about, um, because the uh, then they fight you phase is is well ensconced here. Yeah, uh, we were just saying like last time you were here in our office was three days after FTX blew up. Yeah. Now we just got big news from the F- uh, SEC that Coinbase and Binance are getting sued. Yeah. Um, you're super close to the space. I know you're super in tune with what's going on. Um, we'll get into that more later. Um, before we get into the crypto stuff, I really yep. just kind of want to get more. Um, can you give me a quick background and how you ended up here in RTP and what you love so much about this area of North Carolina? Mm. Yeah, my life's just a series of happy accidents. I, uh, I've been very fortunate and very, very lucky over the years. Although, it's, you know, one thing they say about luck, Thomas Jefferson has a great line. Uh, I'm rather fond of luck seems the harder I work, the more of it I, I tend to have. So I actually agree with that. Um, and I think it was Aristotle or Socrates, I can't remember which one, who said, you know, luck is where preparation meets opportunity. So, so luck is, isn't just, you know, divine intervention or chance. There's, there's a little bit of effort to it. But um, I have had this series of, of happy accidents. I, I grew up on the left coast in Seattle, uh, went to school in the Midwest uh, at Notre Dame, I guess you guys were hanging out in my old stomping grounds in Indiana recently. So, um, and then uh, Chicago, and then actually went back and worked at the alma mater. And I was the number two guy, always going to be the number two guy. And that was fine. I was at the alma mater working with you know people I liked and doing something that, that I loved, working the endowment. Um, but then I got a call, and a recruiter said, hey, there's this job in North Carolina. And uh, I told my wife, she said, take it. I said, don't you want to know what it is? She says, no. I just want to live in North Carolina. She was right. So we moved down here 25 years ago, hard to believe, longest I've ever been anywhere, and sight unseen, kind of came down. Now, the Chamber of Commerce was out in force on our, our visit, so we, we landed uh, on January 1st, 1998. It was 70 degrees. It was about minus 25 in South Bend, and uh, we stayed for three days, and it was gorgeous, and, and they wined us and dined us and, and showed us the university. And, and so I, can't, I did come down here, and I was CIO at UNC for seven years before setting out on my own to, to do Morgan Creek, now coming up on, on 20 years ago. Uh, but it's been great. It's just been a, a great experience. You know, what I love about RTP uh, is the vibrance, right? It's just awesome to be around three amazing you know, research universities in, in Chapel Hill, Duke, and, and NC State. Now, there are other great universities, too, but, you know, those three make up the triangle. And then right here in the center is this amazing place, Research Triangle Park, which it, it attracts a hugely diverse uh, group of people from, from all over the world, uh, all different interests, um, but all, like, pursuing high-end thing, biotech, uh, infotech, computing. Uh, now we've got a big movement of, of Web3 people moving here, and you know, I refer to it as CryptoLina. Um, so that, that's part what I love. I also, you know, I live in Chapel Hill, uh, and other than, you know, we, we jokingly, affectionately refer to it as the PRC, right, the People's Republic of Chapel Hill, other than a little bit of anti-growth and anti-building, uh, it's just a great place to live. The people are great. Uh, the university keeps you know a lot of young people around, a lot of new ideas, a uh, lot of you know very interesting people from professors that are your neighbors, and um, really really enjoy it. And it's a small town feel, 
even you know it's 25,000 or maybe 30,000 now without the students and then closer to 50 60 with students but um very it's cool. a long answer. Yeah, no, that's great. So you worked for the UNC Endowment Fund for seven years. Yep. Um, I love this. This is one of your coolest, like, early success stories. Can you tell me about that little investment you made in that uh, big tech company, a uh, little tech company at the time called Google? Well, that was actually predating UNC. That was all the way back to Notre Dame. Oh, okay. So, you know, I joined nine, uh, Notre Dame's endowment in 93. And in in 95, uh you know, we and we were kids. I mean, Scott and I were were literally children that didn't have a lot of experience. But we had this visionary board chair who said, "Well, who's the best in in the business?" And it was Harvard, Yale, Stanford at the time. So, well, go go talk to them, find out what they do. And so we went out to California and, and hung out with the Stanford guys and and found out what what made them great was they had this huge weight in venture capital. You know, they were housed right next to Kleiner Perkins, which at the time was not famous. I mean, they were starting to be well-known, but they were not a brand name like they are today. I always feel sorry for uh, Caulfield and Byers, right? It was Kleiner Perkins, Caulfield, Byers. But no one ever talks about the last two names. In fact, they don't even talk about Perkins anymore. It's just Kleiner. And there was this other small firm starting uh, called Sequoia. Yeah, now everybody knows Sequoia and Michael Moritz is, is this legendary VC, but he had just been hired. He had never done a deal. Uh, and Don Valentine, who was one of the backers of Intel early on, um, started Sequoia, and, and he hired this, this young Wall Street Journal reporter. And the other partners were like, Don, what the heck? I mean, no, we're, we're the future. This, this guy's never done a deal. And they split into two firms. And you had to choose. And so we're out there talking to Stanford, and he's like, well, I'm, I'm going to go with Don, and, and then, you know, I think he's, he's really the, the guy. And so we followed along, and we gave him $5 million bucks. They put 10% into this little company called Google, which I remember when we told our board, they're like, that's a stupid name. And what do you need another search? There's 20 search engines. There's Alta Vista. There's, there's Web Crawler. There's Ask Jeeves. What do you need another search engine for? And what they didn't understand, what we didn't understand, and, and I'm not even sure Michael or Don actually really understood what Sergey and Larry were doing, is they weren't a search engine. They were an entirely new way of managing and processing information and data. And you know, great stat, right? Uh, in 1991, there were zero websites. Uh, Tim Berners-Lee wrote the first one um, and created the internet, not Al Gore. And uh, although Al Gore should get a little credit for protecting the internet, you know, the, the telephone companies wanted to kill it. So they tried to pass some legislation, which is how incumbents usually act. We'll talk more about that later. And he did block the bill. Um, so that was, that was helpful, but he didn't invent the internet. But uh, Tim Berners-Lee did. And today there are 1.7 billion web pages. About half of them are owned by Google. He says, whoa, what are you talking about? I'm like, well, every time you type a question into that search bar, it sends you to a web page that has all the answers already because that question has usually been asked. Now, if you ask a new question, they'll create a new website, but most questions have been asked, and that's why it knows by the time you type the fifth letter what you're going to type. And that means you don't have to search the whole internet to find what you need. You've indexed this entirely, and it, it's really amazing when you think about it, right? All the information in the world at your fingertips anytime, anywhere, it's a pretty, pretty valuable company. So um, they put 10% in that. That 500 k turned into $200 million. There should be a quad at Notre Dame called the Google Quad. Now, we had a similar outcome, not quite as, as robust, uh, at UNC. Um, we invested with another startup venture capital firm called Benchmark. Uh, this is a funny story. So these guys were all ex-basketball players, all six, four, six, five guys. Uh, all incredibly handsome. I hated hanging out with them. Um, and, you know, they, I moved from Notre Dame down here. We had this relationship and they're like, hey, we like basketball. You know, come, come watch a basketball game, UNC Duke. I'm like, Great. So they came out and they were telling us about this investment they were going to make in this little company called Red Hat. And I was like, oh, great. What, what do they do? Well, they give away software. I'm like, why is that a good business model again? Like, uh, trust us, you know, it's, it's going to be big. You know, open source is going to be big. I didn't get it. They did. Uh, again, it wasn't quite the same outcome as Google, but pretty good outcome. 
uh, sold to IBM for I think forty billion dollars uh, from from a startup. So that worked out well for for UNC and and for others. And I think it it goes to that ability to imagine the unimaginable is a superpower. I mean, it's an absolute superpower. If you can say, well, wait a minute, giving away software, putting your code out there open for other people to use, how is that good? Well, it's good because then you get the talent from all over the world to contribute to projects that that make the world a better place. And uh, Obviously, IBM thought it was pretty valuable, and it's got a big office tower now downtown Raleigh and employs 4,000-plus people and uh, you know, has helped change the world and is a big part of, of what we're doing now in, in Web3, so with the open source and, and all that. So, um, again, long answer, but if you think about investing, uh, one of the things I, I realized had that aha moment in 96 when we got the, the outcome with Google – was if you invest in the infrastructure of computing power changes. What do I mean by that? So pre-1954, there were no computers, right? There you know, was the idea of computing at, at the government level, but 1954, there were a bunch of companies formed out in, in uh, Route 128 up in Boston around mainframe computing. And computers as big as this building you know, were being built. And... You, they cost a lot of money. And a Popular Mechanics, I think, wrote, we can imagine a day when a computer, instead of weighing 3,000 pounds, would only weigh 1,000 pounds. Like, you know, I could lift up my cell phone. It doesn't weigh 1,000 pounds. And it's a supercomputer. Um, more power than NASA, you know, right, back in the 60s. But that mainframe computer in 1954, 14 years later, there's innovation out in Silicon Valley. Don Valentine backed this little company, Intel. You've heard of it. Uh, 14 years later, there's an innovation up in Seattle where I grew up, um, where why most of my friends don't have to work anymore. I wasn't smart enough to go to work for that company called Microsoft. Uh, I always defend myself saying, look at the picture of the original Microsoft 11. You wouldn't have worked with those guys either. Now, they're multi-billionaires. I'm not, so I shouldn't make fun of them, but it's a funny picture. Um, now, why is it always 14 years? Because young people invent the future because they don't know what they don't know. And they're not afraid to fail and they can imagine the unimaginable. Um, so every 14 years, you get this half generation of, of creative types. And, you know, Mark Andreessen, when he invented the browser, was 19 years old. Larry and Sergey were in their 20s. Um, all these people are young because they don't know what they don't know. So in 96, you had the internet uh, 14 years after 82. Then in 2010, the mobile net. And I remember being back in Seattle at Craig McCaw's house, his family office, and uh, he's a big investor in the early days of cell phones. And I asked his family office, do you think the mobile net is going to be as big as the internet? He's like, Mark, are you kidding me? Right? Ask people if they want a computer. Like, yeah, whatever. Ask them if they want a phone. They're like, well, I already have two. I actually have two phones down there. Um, and yeah, it's going to be big. And, and it was. You know, Web1 was huge. Intel, Microsoft, Cisco created about $2 trillion of value. It's big, right? Trillion. We have to sit here in this room for 31,710 years and spend a dollar every second. That's $1 trillion. So $2 trillion is a lot. Uh, but Web2 was bigger. And companies like Alibaba and Amazon and Apple, uh, $5 trillion. Well, now 2024, next year, is the truth net. So it went from the internet to the mobile net to the truth net. And I think it's going to be a $10 trillion plus industry, much bigger than Web 1 and Web 2. So, you know, Web 1 was read. Web 2 is read, write. Web 3 is read, write, own. Owning your own content, owning your own data is monstrous how big the potential is going to be. I love that history lesson. That's so cool. You're around the early days uh, investing in those. It's a nice of way of saying I'm old. So I appreciate <laughs> that. I appreciate that. I'm not that far behind you, really. Um, okay, so Google was that your first big success where you scored? Was that the first yeah. like home yeah. run I mean, for that you? That was the first really, really grand slam home run. You know, you don't make 400 times your money very often. There was a funny one at UNC. Um, we invested with this group out of Boston. And they put a little money with a company that's so funny. They were called Art Technology Group. And what they did 
is they were a consulting firm that helped companies change their name to dot com. Crazy. I mean, not not really that much there yeah. there, but they went public, and our cost basis in the stock was fifty cents, and the stock went public, and it ran all the way to a hundred dollars, and our lockup ended. And we were able to sell, and I called the, the partner, and I said, you know, what do you think? What should, what should I do? He said, well, I'm an insider, so I, I can't really say very much, but I can say a couple things. Revenues, $6 million. Market cap, $6 billion. And I kind of went silent. He's like, Mark? I'm like, um, sell, sell, sell. And, and we did sell, and um, stock went back to four dollars from from a hundred in the crash uh now think about it from 50 cents to four dollars that's still a great outcome eight times your money but it was better to make 200 times so we turned uh 100k into 20 million bucks for the university which is pretty cool um so that's the power of of getting venture right now you'll have zeros but that that's okay you know one of the things about investing that i don't really I mean, I guess I do understand because it's human nature. Um, most people are so afraid of losing that they don't try anything to guarantee they won't lose. Like, well, but if you don't lose, then you can't win, right? If you don't play, and, you know, I just watched Air. Unbelievable movie. Yeah, I that's mean, great. Unbelievable movie. Story so amazing. Changed, you know, the nature of, of so many businesses and – and the fact that MJ still makes so much money every year passively is, is awesome. But, you know, Michael Jordan was famous for something. He said, he said look, I've missed 9,600 shots. I don't even remember taking them. And I think that's the important part, that erasure, right? We made lots of investments that just didn't work out. But you don't focus on those. You focus on the next plan. You know, I, I, you know, I'm living Chapel Hill. I'm a Carolina fan. I don't like to talk about that other school, although I'm wearing closer to their <laughs> color today. Um, but I guess the horse is Carolina blue. But uh, I got to meet with with Kay, and um, he said something that I thought it was really great. And uh, he said, "You know what separates the the great players from the average players?" I'm like, mm, no. And you're going to tell me, right? And he says, well, the average player always focuses on the last play. Like, think about watching the game last night. How many times do you see somebody miss a shot, go down and commit a stupid foul? Happens all the time. He says, a great player focuses on the next play. They don't even remember taking the shot. They go down, play good defense, steal the ball, make a layup. And that is what separates great investors from everybody else, is they're not worried about losing because they know in order to win, you have to lose a lot. You just make the losses small, and you take the loss quickly, and you don't try to double down and prove that you're right. You just admit you're wrong, the market's right, and, and take your loss and move on to the next idea. But that ability to constantly be seeking that, that great idea and put yourself in a position to win. And also, you know, go back to, to Dean Smith. There's this funny thing in his book. Uh, where Jerry Stack, I think it was Stackhouse, took this this you know shot from 18 feet, and clanked it, and uh, Coach called him over and says, "What the hell do you think you're doing?" He says, "Coach, I was wide open." It's like, "Of course you were wide open, you idiot! They want you to take that shot. Go underneath the basket and dunk the ball." So put yourself in the right position for your skills and 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 for what you're good at, and and also partner with with great visionary people. And there are so many. It's what I love about you know, my late. I'm a late in life venture capitalist, right? I was a investment guy, and then I became an allocator and a chief investment officer, and then a fund of funds guy. And five years ago, I became a late in life venture capitalist. And and what I love about it is hanging out with incredible, visionary, hungry, smart people, um, and partnering with them, and putting capital in their hands, putting the ball in their hands, because um, the winners want the ball at the end of the game. And in air, there's that great thing about, you know, they drew the play up to give the ball, not to James Worthy, right? The number one pick in the draft. No, to give the ball to Michael. That was amazing. And that guy saw that 
And that was what, you know, he said, this is our guy. And it turns out maybe the best player in history. I love that. Yeah, I just watched Air with my wife probably like two weeks ago. Did you notice they never showed Michael's face in the yes. whole movie? Yeah, yeah, because he didn't agree. Is that that? That's yeah, what I yeah. figured. Why I figured yeah. they did that. He on He did not agree because he said, "I, you're, you, this is your story. You're telling it from your perspective, not mine." And he may have some creative differences. I don't know, but um, you know, he wasn't in the room right when they were talking about creating the shoe, and he wasn't. You know, so they didn't really need him. Right. to do the movie because it was really a story about Nike yeah. and about Phil and and about um um now I can't remember the the protagonist's name but Oh yeah. Yeah, Ben Affleck killed it. Like that oh, was a great director so, director piece. I mean it was so so great. I mean it was just a great great movie. Yeah. Great movie. Loved it. I want to watch it again. Yep. I, I it's one of those movies worth yep. watching twice. Okay, so you talked about winning. Sonny Vaccaro. Sonny. There yeah, you go. Sonny. Yeah, that was Matt Damon's character, yeah, yeah. right? And and look. Yeah. Look Mad genius. Yeah. But then the designer, I can't remember his name, who designed the shoe yeah, and came remember. up with the name, although the agent claims he came up with the name, but all those things together, it was, it was the hive mind, right? It was the collective intelligence that, and that's, again, that's part of what makes Web3 so amazing, is we get more collective intelligence um, than just singular intelligence. Yeah. So you mentioned winning, what it feels like to win, betting on the right companies. Yep. Let's take the opposite approach. Yeah. I know that, like, as a VC, you make bad bets sometimes. You make bad investments. Tell me about some of the low points in your investing career. What was that like? Oh, if you don't want to say, if you don't want to say no, company no, names, no, that's look, okay. You know, There's so many. I mean, that that said, the and again, I don't mean this in a braggadocious way, but what separates you know good slash great investors from the others is they have lots more losses. I got plenty of losses. Um, and that doesn't mean I'm a great investor, but but I have lots of losses and, and lots of, of low points. But but I don't stay there. Right? I don't wallow in self pity, and I don't wallow in the loss. Uh, I think I've I've and I, I tweet about this a lot. I have this hashtag edge, and it's it's my thing. And people get mad and they you know, tweet pictures of the edge shaving cream. Like what is I don't know what is edge? You know, stupid. I'm like don't follow me then. I mean it's my thing, and. It's the, the characteristics, I think, that make people great, right? And resilience is one. Um, persistence. Uh, you know, erasure, right? The ability to, to not remember you know, your – well, it's not that you don't remember them, but it's you can forget them. It's – again, Dean Smith in his book says, with mistake, we all make them, but you got a Ralph. Recognize it, really hard. Admit it really, really hard, because no one likes to admit they're wrong, uh, learn from it, and then forget it. Um, so you got to go through that process. But you know, I've had so many, so many low points. So I mean, in my, in my early, early days, so I, I got into investing, I said, happy accident. I was working for an insurance company, the guy doing investments retired. And uh, I took over. And, um, you know, it was 1987. And uh, just fresh out of business school. And um, Long story short, you know, the crash happened. Now, that was more an equity crash, but and we had more bonds. Um, but they're, part of the reason equities are crashing is because they're raising interest rates. And so we had this fixed income portfolio was getting hammered. And But from that, that low point of not really understanding how to be a, a treasury trader um, and having it thrust on me, I realized, you know, I'm going to get some help. And I went out and I hired this guy, Dan Fuss. Uh, outsource some of the capital to him before he was famous. Now he's this legend, I mean, truly legendary investor from Luma Sales. We also hired this guy up in in uh, Minnesota, Mike Brilly, who was just this amazing guy. He found this really crazy thing. And back in the old days, they used to have these long in, you know, bond indentures uh, that that would spell out all the, the terms of a bond. And he found this thing with um, – Mobile home bonds. Because if you think about a mobile home, right, the moment you drive it off the lot, it depreciates 30% and everyone's upside down. So these bonds have a, a very low default rate because people just can't pay them off. Um, and they just keep making their payments. Um, but on occasion, people do just, just walk away. And he found in these 400-page indentures that these companies that issued these bonds were required to create a sinking fund of treasuries. So basically, you had a claim on treasury securities, which have no risk at all, and yet you're getting paid these high yields. And so you know, I, I learned the lesson that, that you know, finding great people 
to outsource some of your capital to was, was a good thing. So from a, from a loss, from a from bad experience. And then I transferred over to the equity side and a really low period. That's where I learned another valuable lesson. So uh, I had a rollover from my first job to my second job. And uh, uh, you know, it was just, you know, right about the time that Intel and Microsoft and all these companies were coming public and I'm like, oh, I'm, I use, you know, I got a computer. I'm like one of the computer nerds. All right, I'll, I'll do that. And uh, about the day I was signing up to 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 invest, uh, this guy came in our office, and we were a, a value investment shop. And this guy came in, and he was pitching these ideas to my to my bosses. And uh, he's like, uh, Hey, Mark, you, know, you should you should invest in these two companies. And um, like an idiot, I listened without thinking, why is he telling me? Well, because he's a salesperson. That's his job to sell these things. He doesn't care if they're good, bad, or indifferent. He's a salesperson. He's not an investment manager. And I bought those two crappy little stocks, and one went to zero. Now, one did go up 2x, but net-net, I, I kept the same amount of money, and Intel and Microsoft went up a lot. So that was a low point. And I, but I learned Think about incentives. Think about why people are telling you and, and sharing ideas. Um, you know, another low point was, uh, you know, at, at Notre Dame, you know, we had lots of success in, in venture capital. But uh, we also had uh, some fixed income exposure um, back when the Fed in 1994 did their big seven interest rate increases in, in like six months and, and bond markets collapsed and we're like, oh. Okay, that wasn't, wasn't so good. But it was, again, learning lesson. And, and uh, you know, we realized that we could replace some of that bond exposure. We actually coined a term called absolute return, which is a form of hedge fund uh, that did arbitrage. And, um, you know, then I came to North Carolina, and one of the low points was it wasn't really an investment low point. It was funny. I came in and I did my first 100 days report, like, like a new president. And uh, I went into the board, and I um, – presented it, and they looked at me like, so you're telling us we've done all this stuff wrong? Because I made 40 recommendations, and I should have said 40 observations. So I learned a valuable lesson about diplomacy. Right? They didn't want to be told that they were doing stuff wrong, even if they were, but they wanted you know, to say, okay, here's some ideas that maybe you can make as your own and, and then go through. Um, you know, other low points were... Uh, on the, you know, on the investing side, um, after uh, the global financial crisis, we did really, really well. And again, I don't mean that in a braggadocious well, but, but I got super lucky in going into the global financial crisis. So we had a client. It's a funny story. So we had a client. He was the founder of J. Crew, right? And he had sold it to a private equity firm, 300 million bucks. Pretty good deal. It's worth a lot more than that now, but, but you know, he, he was happy with his 300 million. And he retired to Incline Village, Nevada, which is a place where you go uh, if you don't want to pay California taxes. And he called us up one day in 2006 and said he was madder than a wet hen. And this guy was 83 years old, quoted Sartre, great shape. I mean, he was a, he was a tough client. I loved him. And, uh, you know, God rest his soul, he did pass away. But um, he said, uh, I deserve to live here. Well, of course, Ar of course, Arthur, you, you deserve to live here. He says, yeah, I have three hundred million dollars. Average house in this neighborhood's twelve million dollars. Guys on either side of me, young kids, thirty-five years. There's no way they can afford this. This ends badly. Find me a way to get short. I'm like, okay. So we went out and we met this guy, John Paulson, and we met John Burbank, and we met Kyle Bass and and Phil Falcone, and we actually took ten percent of client assets and put it in the short subprime trade, you know, the big short. And the first month, um, we lost 30%. If you remember the scene in the big short where the Goldman guys are saying, yeah, we're going we're gonna, to you know, tighten the screws on these guys. Now, the good news is we couldn't get out because we probably would have sold because you know, you're not supposed to lose 30% your first month. Um, and then we made 500%. So not quite as good as venture capital, but, but pretty darn good for, for liquid. And that kind of pushed us uh, from a no-name firm to, to one being a pretty well-known firm, particularly in, in Research Triangle. And, um, but after the global financial crisis, 
we didn't understand QE. I didn't really appreciate how um, vigilant the Fed was going to be at propping up the markets. And so we stayed short longer than we should have. And, you know, we didn't lose a ton, but we didn't make as much on the way up. And that was a, that was a pretty big low point. We lost a decent amount of business because of that, but uh, plenty of plenty of we could talk all day about, <laughs> about the losses. Yeah, you don't hear people. No one really talks about the losses as much. It's it's easier to brag about the no, wins, right? Look, it's easy. To, it's easy to brag about winners. People like to talk about winners. Um, but here's the thing: I have this this buddy, Bill Duhamel, uh, runs a firm called Route One out in uh, California, and uh, he's interesting. He's a, a late in life investor. He grew up. His family owned cable television. And he was going to do the family business. And they said, oh, I don't really like that. And he went to work for this hedge fund uh, out in San Francisco and kind of learned the ropes. And then he spun out uh, to do his own thing. And he has this white piece of paper as you walk into their office. And it says, with every investment, we get richer or wiser, never both. And it's 100% true. If you make an investment and you do well, you don't analyze it. You just look how smart I am. I'm, I'm so awesome. When you lose money, you analyze it, and you actually learn. And, and it's so absolutely true. And, and in fact, the corollary to that is if you get on a roll of being right, you set yourself up for super failure because you let your guard down. And I used to say that you know, if you think about investing, if you feel good about an investment, you're probably going to lose money. If you feel really good, you're going to lose a lot of money. And it's the equivalent of, remember if we were taking a test in school and you thought you aced it and you got it back and you're like, I didn't get a D. How did I get a D? You didn't even know what you didn't know. You were so overconfident. When you walk out of a test and you feel like you flagged, you usually got a good grade because you actually knew what they were asking. And the same thing with investing. If you make an investment and you feel a little sick to your stomach, you probably do pretty well. If you feel really badly, like it's really painful, you make a lot of money. And, I, and I'll give you a perfect example. So my first board meeting at UNC, so I'm you know, freshly scrubbed. I'm 34 years old. Why they gave me the job, I'll never know. Although my, the chairman later told me, I would never hire anyone over 35. <laughs> no way, right? You know, in your 20s are for getting educated. Your 30s are for establishing your reputation. Your 40s and 50s are for capitalizing on your reputation. Your 60s and 70s are for enjoying your reputation. It's like, hmm, it's pretty interesting. So an education doesn't mean school. It means learning the business. But he says, look, in your 30s, that's when you're going to work the hardest. And you're going to be burned out and then you know, go off and do something else. But he, he gave me the job. And I come in the first board meeting. And uh, most people won't remember, but The Economist magazine had this cover. It said, a world of wash and oil. And these roughnecks covered in oil. And it was basically, oil is 11 bucks. And the content of the article is basically, we have too much oil. And oil is going to go to zero. And in fact, someday it, it will be free. I'm like, that just doesn't make sense to me. And I have this rule. If, I'm, if I hear it once, I remember it. If I hear it twice, I write it down. If I hear it three times, I do something about it. And I remembered that. About two weeks later, Richard Rainwater, famous investor from Texas, on the cover of Business Week, naked long, $900 million of oil. Back in 1998, that was a lot of money. And um, took that baby out and put it on the desk. Then uh, about three weeks later, these three young guys trained by Richard uh, were spinning out to form a firm called Natural Gas Partners that actually invested in oil and gas. I'm like, ding, 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 ding. Okay, so I go to the meeting and I say, all right, I want to take 1% and give it to these guys and 5% total and give it to some other oil and gas managers. And, and the chairman says, Mark, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. But if you really want to do it, okay. I'm like, okay, great, great. So he calls me in the chancellor's office afterwards and says, Mark, when I say that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard, that's what I meant. The rest of the stuff was just to be nice to the rest of the audience. I'm like, okay. And the chancellor says, well, well, Max, if, you know, we just hired him, you know, so – you know, maybe we should try some of his ideas. And if, if they don't work out, you know, then we can fire him. Um, but, and I'm like, well, guys, I'm, I'm sitting right here. Like, I, we're just talking about firing. And I'm like, all right, fine. Um, 
and again, not not that we're geniuses, but the guys at Natural Gas Partners were, uh, and Merit Energy and a couple others, that 5% we put in uh, energy generate 25% of the endowment's returns the next decade. And it was because it felt really, really bad. And it's when you make a recommendation and, and people are like, no, that's just stupid. That's when it's not in the price. When you do something, everybody says, oh, yeah, that's the smartest thing ever. It's already in the price. So you're not going to make a lot. doesn't mean you won't make any, but probably in most cases you end up losing money because it's, again, already in the price. Sounds like all that ties back into Edge, like you talk about a lot yeah. on Twitter. Um, another important lesson I learned, uh, you were recently on uh, Invest Answers, James at Invest Answers, one of my favorite YouTubers, by the way. He puts out phenomenal content does, every really day. Um, you guys were talking about variant perception, and all that seems like it kind of ties yeah. in nicely to Edge and kind of having the foresight to look where other people are scared to go, right? Variant perception is is really, really, really important. I mean, like, like super important. And it's funny, I... I learned that from a, a book where, you know, you, you learn most good things, right? To say if you want, you want to have, you know, big ideas, read old books. Uh, or want to have new ideas, read old books. Um, and so there's this book written called The Dow Jones Averages. And Dow is T-A-O. And it's written by this guy, Bennett Goodspeed. And um, he had this business where he would read all of these publications, trade journals and stuff, and and he would then present companies with variant perceptions. Like says, here's the conventional wisdom and, and here's the, the the green space or the, the white space, greenfield. And uh, he he wrote this book where it merged Chinese philosophy, Eastern philosophy, and investing. And one of the things I love and you can't get it now except in secondhand, so you gotta buy it through Amazon. Um, but it's best book I've ever read read about investing. And the the preface says, dedicated to those with the guts to trust their gut. And what it talks about is um, there are two sides of your brain. You know, most of us guys uh, were right-handed and left-brained, meaning very analytical, and we do everything looking in the rearview mirror and looking at the data. The problem with looking in the rearview mirror, if you're driving a car, if the road turns, you go right off the cliff. And one of the things he talks about is uh, left-handed people, right-brained people, and more women who tend to have – it's called women's intuition for a reason – tend to use the, the right side of their brain, the more intuitive side. And uh, they actually did a study. Terry O'Dean did a study, man, men versus women, and uh, found that women outperform men routinely by almost 2 percent for three reasons. They don't overtrade, Right. Uh, they don't invest in things they don't understand, so they don't think they're smarter than the markets. Um, and they're willing to admit they're wrong and take a loss, uh, whereas the guy wants to prove he's right. And that's not universally true. There are good traders who are guys, and there are probably women who are bad investors. But um, it was this whole thing about using both sides of your brain. And, you know, we're hunter-gatherers, right? <laughs> it's in our DNA. I, I tell the funny story about the ketchup, right? My wife says, get the ketchup. I open the fridge. I don't see it. She says, walks up. She's right there. If it ain't moving, I can't see it. And and it's true. It happened to be again the other night looking for the, the chocolate syrup. Um, but, you know, if somebody's moving out in the hallway, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see them, not because I'm ignoring you, but that's what I'm going to do. So I think if we think about that, that investing edge and a, and a variant perception, Michael Steinhardt, Right, famous investor, hedge fund guy, said um, to all his people, including like an intern, uh, you got two minutes to tell me what's consensus, okay? What is a variant perception that you think could, you know, be better than per, per uh, consensus? What's the catalyst and the timing? And if you couldn't do that, he said, I got no time for you, and I'm not going to put the position on. And I think that was really important. So to, to have a variant perception, you got to understand what the consensus is. So you actually have to think about it. Um, to come up with a variant perception, you have to think outside the box, or better, think like there is no box. Uh, but then you have to think about catalysts, right? You know, things can stay status quo for a long time, particularly if 
there's interested parties, which again, is going on right now. There are a lot of interested parties that don't want to be disrupted. So they're going to fight really hard not to be disrupted. Um, but to, to imagine the unimaginable, that, that, that is, that's what the, that variant perception really is all about. That's so fascinating. I love hearing you talk about that and learning about that. Um, so 2023, there's content everywhere. You're a busy guy. You're managing a lot of high net worth individuals' money. You probably have very limited time to watch videos, podcasts. Yeah. How do you – what what do you listen to on the daily basis, whether it be mm. YouTube, podcasts, ah, You stole Twitter. my favorite question. Yeah. I love asking this question to people. You know, what's the one thing you yeah. can't live without? I'm, I, I hate to admit it. And, and why do I hate to admit it? Because I – I, I want it to be better than it is, but it is still the best thing out there is, is Twitter. Um, you know, most of my life revolves around it now. Most of my people, I had breakfast with guys this morning that met on Twitter and uh, a lot of my friends around the world, uh, relationships I built uh, happen that way. Um, and it's it's so good in so many ways. And and for me, it I use it as a micro blog, right, like a journal. And so I can go back and, and kind of read what I wrote. And, and uh, there's a great line, if I can't read what I wrote, how do I know what I think? And um, I also, I, I use hashtags a lot. People yell at me, I'm like, that's not what hashtags are for. I, I'm not trying to trend. They're for me. They're a filing system. Because I can search my handle and hashtag whatever, like fiat fiasco or hashtag, you know, gravity rules or whatever. Math is hard. And math is hard. And, and it'll have all the things that I was looking at when I had that in mind, and it helps me, you know, crystallize my thoughts. So so that's something that that I use. And, um, you know, I, I there's, a, there's a piece that I, I don't read as often as I should. I should read it every single week, but I, but I don't. Uh, 13D Research, uh, this guy Kirill Sokolov, he, he's, the, he's a seer, right? He's somebody who, who, who just sees around corners. He sees the future. He's an amazing story, um, adult onset deafness, first cochlear implant, personal friends of the Dalai Lama. I mean, he, just amazing, amazing story. But his stuff's really expensive. I mean, so I, I, I hate – yeah, I – it's not like you can go get it for free. I mean, you have to pay for it. And um, but if you work for an investment firm, they likely have it. But but I, I probably couldn't live without that. Um, he, I mean, it's what's the one thing I really will pay for. Um, you know, I stopped reading the newspaper a long time ago. I mean, I don't read the journal. I don't read the Times. I and that wasn't because of the whole mainstream media woke. Not that had nothing to do. It, it was just. I found it wasn't interesting. I wasn't getting anything out of it. And, and part of it is, back to, to the web, um, if, you, if, you, if you just think about the history, if you go back thousands of years, the church had a monopoly on information. Right? Most people couldn't read and write. You went to church, and they told you what to think, how to think, when to think, what to do, where to go, and they were the boss. And most people didn't travel, and, you know, they just accepted whatever they heard from the pulpit. And the printing press busted that monopoly wide open, right? Now you could transfer information and store information and, and teach and, and learn. And, and so what happened? Well, governments took over and media. So state-owned media and state-sponsored media. It says, you know, U.S. isn't state-owned media. I'm like, really? Did you ever watch ABC, NBC, CBS? They said the same things. They were given talking points, and you can do it today, right? You watch, you think Fox and CNN are totally different, and people say the same thing. It's like, how can that be? It's because they're talking points. And so the state took over, but the internet busted that wide open because information became bidirectional for the first time. So in the olden days, if I wanted to know about the Argentinian election, I would wait for someone from the New York Times to send a reporter to BA, write a story, edit it, Three days later, it would show up on page seven, buried somewhere. Now, I go on Twitter. I watch a periscope of somebody standing in line in the rain chanting Mockery's name. I'm like, yeah, that dude's going to win. So that bidirectionality of information uh, changed the world. Well, now we're on another equally big change where value is becoming bidirectional with blockchains. And that's just a monstrous 
transition. And so um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else that I, I really, I, you know, I do, I do listen to some podcasts um, and, you know, Pomp's always done some, some good ones, although I don't listen to his as often because I've, you know, I've, I've heard most of the really good ones at the beginning. Yeah. It's hard, right, to create content every couple days for years um, you know, because there's only so many really great people to talk to. Um, but I, I do listen to stuff. You know, part of it, too, is I get really good information content doing this, right? Because when people prep to do an interview, they've dug into topics that I have an interest in. And so they just the dialogue and the exchange is really good. So I do a lot of podcasts as a guest, but it's actually interesting for me, too. Um, so that's part of it. Um, yeah, that's probably it. That's cool. You know, I, I've learned just getting in the finance world, it's really easy with social media to get stuck in your own echo chamber, right? That's something you got to be careful about, yeah. especially with like investing in crypto and altcoins. You can find any echo chamber for any shitcoin in the world, right? When it's, and it's worse now because the algorithms do that, yeah. right? If you like something, it'll feed you more of that. And worse it'll suppress the antithesis of that. Um, so one, I, I use the follow tab, not the for you tab. Because the for you tab is like every third tweet is Elon. I'm like, I, I don't really care what he says <laughs> at all. So um, the second thing I do is I follow people that I know I disagree with. Um, ideologically, philosophically, lifestyle state, life stage, um, and so having a diversity of thought, but that's, look, that, that's, that's not saying anything new. When, when I came to North Carolina, the board, and I don't mean this in as strong a criticism as it'll sound, but, you know, the board that I, I was hired by was 11 guys, nine of them from the same fraternity. They were all within 10 years of each other. That's not diverse. There's no diversity of thought. There's no, I mean, there wasn't diversity of anything. And, and it wasn't a surprise that they underperformed. Um, not because any of the individuals weren't smart, but Byron uh, Ween wrote, um, not Byron Ween, Barton Biggs wrote a great piece about this at Morgan Stanley back in the 90s called Group Stink. And it basically is the best two pages ever written on why groups make bad decisions. Like if I ask all of us in this room, you know, give me the best restaurant in RTP. And if I ask individually, I'll get a good answer. If I ask the group, I'll get McDonald's. Because everybody's afraid. If I say a Pakistani place, or if I say an Indian place, or if I say a seafood place, maybe I won't be invited back to the group. So I got to stay on the group. So I'll say continental food. Well, uh, maybe somebody does that. McDonald's. Everyone loves McDonald's. And groups just tend toward mediocrity. Not the meat. I, I like McDonald's. I, I, you know, it's not not bad, but but it's mediocre, right? Um, it's not fine food, and that's true with with decision making. Diverse groups make better decisions, and so if if you're following all the same people and you're getting all the same opinions and you're in that echo chamber, and then the algorithms are amplifying it, you're not going to make good decisions. You're not going to have good ideas. And look, part of the biggest challenge today is between social media and media, broad media, and these algorithms and the beginnings of AI, we've, we've gotten to this super polarized place where you're not allowed to have dialogue and debate in search of truth. That's what conversation is supposed to be about. I'm not supposed to be trying to convince you of my view. I'm supposed to be trying to learn from you and test my own beliefs. And it's, it's one of the problems with human nature, right, is belief, and there's a book written about this, beliefs should be formed like this. We should gather all information, take it in, spend time in solitude to think about it and reflect on it and form a belief. That's not how it works. We're given our beliefs by our parents, by the media, by governments, by school systems, and then we reject all information against that belief, even people. 
Like, oh, that person's a Democrat. I can't talk to them. That person's a Republican. I can't talk. What are you talking about? That, that's just insane. Uh, and we amplify information that supports our belief. Well, that's not a belief. You have to actually think, do I believe that? Do I really? And, you know, one of the things, if you ask anyone what they think about the, the thing, right, the first thing out of their mouth will be parroting someone else. Because they haven't, in most cases, some do, but most people don't spend the time saying, okay, I heard that. What do I think about that? What do I, how do I feel about that? How does that, and, but that's because we're busy and we're constantly bombarded with information and we don't spend the time, and solitude is a really important point. And there's this piece that everyone should read. It's called Solitude and Leadership by William Derizowitz. And it's basically his, uh, speech to the uh, pleb class of um, pleb class pleb class of the uh, of um, the Army Academy and West Point, and it basically says you need to have independent thought. You need to get out of the bath of conventional wisdom, and and if you're going to be leaders and you be strong leaders. You have to have the ability to spend time in solitude, in reflection, and you know, reject conventional wisdom and, and actually challenge authority. And, and uh, that's what leaders do. I love that. That's so awesome. Um, shifting away from finance and business, uh, have you been – I know you, you mentioned you got into action sports kind of recently. Have you been <laughs> able to hit the skate park at all with your son lately? Uh, you know – as you might expect, uh, 12-year-old attention span is, is relatively low. So we, we've done a lot of things. And, and look, we have this unique family. So uh, I have two older kids, 34 and 32, uh, and now three grandkids. Uh, and then we have the caboose, who's, who's 20 years younger. And uh, so I've done a number of things with him. Um, I, always, I always joke, you know, I'll come home and he'll say, Dad, let's wrestle on the floor because that was a lot easier at 40 than it is at 60. Um, and one of those things was skateboarding. Uh, so maybe two summers ago, uh, no, no, it was longer than that. So uh, right before the lockdowns, so it was 2019, yeah, it was 2019, um, we went out to California uh, where our daughter was living at the time and did the whole you know big skate park in Santa Monica and um, his eyes just got big and and so we went and bought skateboards in Santa Monica. So we had these really cool Tony Alva skateboards and um, we got back here and and there's a little skate park up uh, uh, near the uh, Homestead Park and and we went there a couple times and you know falling I mean, at 60 is, is a little you know he, he bounces right up as a 12 year old but but we did that for a year and when we met last summer uh we were still pretty actively doing that this year he has been uh totally in to valorant he you know he he left Fortnite. that's boring now i guess uh, that was the big thing right forever but now he plays valorant and and you know they're He's got this network of kids all of, like I walked in the other day and it's interesting. So my wife stayed home with the first two and then she was working when we had the third and he had a babysitter. So she's from Argentina and she spoke Solamente Espanol to Will since he's been five weeks old. So he's bilingual. And I walked by and he's talking to someone in Spanish. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And the guy's in Spain. So they're playing together virtually. And what was really cool is, is the kid said, you're in the United States. Your Spanish is so good. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's amazing. And we're actually going to Spain in three weeks with his babysitter who has a daughter and a son in Spain. So I'm totally psyched about that. But uh, lately, um, I've been playing a lot of lacrosse with him, um, So, which isn't quite as dangerous as skateboarding, but uh, I've been doing that a lot. Uh, and then the other day um, with his babysitter's grandson. Um, we did a little, uh, did a little soccer uh, or football because that's you know that's now all the rage with Wrexham and, and all that stuff. So uh, we call that an action sport. Um, and then really cool thing we did for my for my 60th, uh, we went to Smoky Mountain National Park um, 
up in in Tennessee and did a bunch of hiking. So that that's that's my thing. I, I love hiking, love camping. Uh, although we glamped, so which is not really camping, but I mean you're in a tent, but it's on a platform and a yeah. bed and and a you know a running running water. But um, those are my big things. Uh, and then the only other thing we do that again I wouldn't call it an action sport. Um, but we do, we do play uh, a little Pokemon Go. So you'll see us walking around this weekend down in, down at the beach, chasing, chasing the AR Pokemon. Very cool. Yeah. My son, uh, my son's 13 or 14. He's really into that as well. So cool. Um, all right, let's shift back into crypto. It's been a big week. A lot of stuff happening. Yeah. Uh, man, where do we even begin? So again, last time you were here, FTX crashed. Yep. It was probably could be the bottom of the bear market. We don't know yet. We think so. Yeah. Now, this week, a couple of uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, uh, today's June 8th for the record, uh, we found out the SEC was suing Binance and Coinbase, right? Yeah. Look, I, I think it's all connected. I, I really do. I, I think all of this is, is connected to this, you know, then they fight you phase. So, look, you know, digital assets really started in 2009 with Satoshi Nakamoto doing the white paper and launching Bitcoin. And from 2009 to 2015, was the, you know, there's the famous Gandhi quote that Gandhi didn't say, and I always wish I could remember who said it, but, you know, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And 2009 to 15, first they ignore you, right? No one in banking or finance or government cared, a bunch of nerds and geeks playing through magic internet money. I mean, the guy bought two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin and, you know, who cared, Right. Um, Papa John's didn't, you know, keep it or could have been worth a lot of money. They're like, I want, I want money. I want, I want fiat. And so no one really cared. And, you know, the second stage is then they laugh at you. So 2016 to, to 21, right? Well, wait a second. It's a hundred billion dollars of value. It's $500 billion of value. It's, it's trillion dollars of value. Ah, bunch of nerds and geeks playing through magic internet money. Who cares? And, and look, a billion dollars leaves the banking system, you know, because the banks are paying zero. And you could take that fiat, convert it to a stable coin or a digital asset, deposit it at one of these lenders, Celsius or Voyager or BlockFi, and they'd pay you 6 to 8%. And that was better. A billion dollars leaves the bank. Who cares? $10 billion? Yeah, whatever. Ha, ha, ha. A hundred billion? Now we got a freaking problem. So 2022, last year to, to today, now you got a problem. And, and I will argue, it's just my, my theory, and you know, he says, oh, you scared, you're such a conspiracy theorist. I'm like, well, remember, it's only a conspiracy if it isn't true. Truth is an absolute defense. So I will, I will make the case that, you know, back, and this was on my birthday last year, it was a bad birthday present. So Luna came to Terra, which I always thought was ironic. Right, so Luna comes back down to Earth. I'm wearing the the moon socks today, um, and that was bad. And Sam and and the gang and and others, three three arrows capital in over in Singapore, were on the wrong side of that trade, and vaporized a bunch of money. And it turns out, algorithmic stable coins like an oxymoron, jumbo shrimp, etc. Um, nothing stable about it, and it was a stupid idea from day one. And Doquan. I don't know if he's a criminal, but that was pretty stupid. Um, and it wasn't stupid that he created it because he made a lot of money. It was people stupid that people bought it, uh, and it was destined to fail. And, and I always thought the, the other funny part was that it was all on the Anchor platform. I mean, come on, you couldn't make that up. Um, so everybody got drugged down. And then the losses from Three Arrows Capital, they defaulted on the loans, took Celsius down. Well, Sam Bankman Fried from FTX owed Celsius a bunch of money. And you know the old line about if you borrow a thousand dollars, you got a uh, bank banker. If you borrow a million, you got a partner. Sam had partners because he had borrowed a lot of money. Now he stole it, but that's a whole other thing. Um, but he looked at Celsius and he was going to save them. But they looked inside and said, oh, geez, Alex, what the heck did you do? You kind of blew this place up with this silly token. And look, if you use a token 
as collateral, it's a circular argument and it's destined to fail. It's like if you, if you created a bank equity token and let your customers borrow against it, it's the equity of your bank, which is what the loans are. I mean, it's just silly. So, so Celsius, he couldn't save. So he just walked away, let them, you know, uh, file bankruptcy. Then Voyager that had problems. Oh, I'll save Voyager because the, the balance sheet hole is not big enough. Well, I will argue that the reason he saved them and then tried to do the same thing with BlockFi is he owed them a lot of money and he didn't want to pay it because he didn't have it because he had given it away and stolen it and lost it uh, on Luna. And so we didn't find that out until November. And then they realized the whole thing was just a giant fraud. And he's a bad guy. Now, I will argue he's just the useful idiot. He's not the mastermind. And Caroline, definitely not the mastermind. That higher up people and you know, don't have time to go into all that. But so FTX blows up. Uh, price goes all the way down to 15000 bucks, And that was the end. Right? See, so I... I will say that crypto winter ended last June 15th, right? That was the, the Father's Day weekend when we went from, you know, we hit like 15.7 for a couple seconds. And then we were in recovery mode. And, and crypto spring doesn't mean straight up. Spring is very volatile and basically flat. And, but I didn't see Hurricane Sam. You know, we live in North Carolina. And every 10 years or so, we get a big snowstorm in like March, April. Because you get a squall that just you know swirls off the coast, called a snow cane, and so I missed Hurricane Sam or Snow Cane Sam. So it was a you know late you know spring, early spring, late winter kind of storm, and just bad guy doing bad things, and so that all unwound, and and that was really the bottom. So since then we had this amazing recovery, right? Up you know at one point a hundred percent, and. Uh, now I will argue that next week, you know, June 15th, we'll be at the equinox again and we'll end up in crypto summer. Now, what is crypto summer? Well, crypto summer is where, again, you have lots of volatility, but you're trending slowly up as you get to the halving. And then when you get to the halving, after that, three months after that, you get to, because the halving's in April, and then the next June, you get to crypto fall, which is that's the parabolic oh my God, FOMO, and everybody's in, and we'll go way past fair value and then have to have another winter. Um, so all of that comes back to this week, which, or, you know, which is um, you know, the FTX thing was bad and it caused a lot of stress. Now, you would say, well, what does the SEC have to do with all of that? Well, here's the thing. The SEC, under its previous leadership, was actually all the things you would want from a regulator. They were measured. They didn't just rush in and say, everything's a security. They were consistent. They said, huh, Bitcoin, it's a commodity. It's not a security. Ethereum, it's a commodity, not a security. These other things, we need to look closer. And I'm like, wow. So Jay Clayton kind of did what, what a regulator is supposed to do, right? Protect consumers and and he let the things that that seemed like they were good plans work well then this new guy comes in and suddenly that all changes and suddenly people ask for clarity and you know brian armstrong at coinbase said 30 different times please just give us a ruling right just tell us what the rules are and we will f follow them we'll comply like nope we're not going to tell you. And it reminds me of the joke, uh, IRS, you owe us money. Me. Okay. How much? IRS. Guess. Me. 25000 IRS. Wrong. Jail. I, if you know how much I owe you, just tell me. And I'm happily to pay, happy to pay it. But if I guess and guess wrong, which is kind of what happened here, and now you're going to enforce, well... Regulation by enforcement is an inferior strategy. And Hester P Pierce, you know, who's one of the commissioners, has on the record said, yeah, no. Because uh, I guess he's not really her boss. They're just, you know, equal appointees. Um, and 
I just don't really understand unless there's an ulterior motive. And if that ulterior motive is to slow down this disruption that's happening to the banking system, then it makes more sense. Because if you think about it, the internet disrupted media and commerce. ABC, NBC, CBS, all of their market cap ended up at Netflix because they didn't want to give up the old to go good, give up the good to go for the great. They didn't want to give up the ad-based revenue model, go to subscription because their stock price was suffering in the short term. And you know the Amazon roadkill trade, long Amazon, short everything else. Okay, that worked out all right. And um, look, blockchain does the same thing to financial services for 800 years. It's a long time. It's a long time, right? In the old days, I lent you money, and uh, you came, and I wrote down in my ledger, you owe me a hundred dollars, and you come back uh, to pay me the hundred and ten next year, and um, I'm an unscrupulous guy. I changed it to two hundred. And you're like, here's your hundred and ten. I'm like, no, you owe me two twenty. Like, well, what do you mean? It says right here in the ledger, do single entry accounting. I'm a bad guy. You're you're stuck. So the Medici's 800 years ago came along and said, you know, you keep a ledger, you keep a ledger, and we, the benevolent Medici's, for a small fee, will make sure the ledgers match. But here's the problem. The Medici's, maybe they were willing to, um, let's just say, fudge the numbers. So you wrote down 100, I wrote down 100. I say, hey, Medici's, I'm going to change mine to 200. I'll give you half. Like, oh, okay, cool. So you come back to pay the 100. It says 200. No! Medici said, you must have made, you must have written it down wrong. We're sorry. And so it's a rig system. And now we have technology with a third ledger. You write down 100, I write down 100. The third ledger with no human intervention says, yep, that's the right number. I can't cheat. So but what does that do? Well, that takes the, the, the middleman or the middle person out of the equation. I don't need to trust the bank anymore. I don't need the Medici's. I don't need JP Morgan. I don't need the Rothschilds. It's they don't like that. It's an immutable ledger in cyberspace now. Exactly. And look, immutable, permanent, encrypted truth is an amazing thing. It is unimaginable. 20 years ago, that that could exist. I mean, Tim May wrote about it in 1988. And for 20 years, no one cared because Tim May was an anarchist living up in the mountains by himself. <laughs> he had no influence. But he wrote the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto, basically saying everything that would happen over the next 30 years. But no one read it. And if you haven't read it, you should read it. It's really good. It's not even that long. And then in 2008, nine, Satoshi Nakamoto, whoever he, she, they are, I guess he identified once as a he, so it's probably a he. Um, I think it's a group of he's. And um, they created this unique digital asset. And Eric Schmidt says it best. He said, you know, guy from Google, back, everything goes back to Google. Uh, look, the ability to create a unique asset in the digital world is big. And big companies are going to be built on that. And I use this simple example of... Uh, uh, foreigner. So, uh, you know, rock music guy, and uh, maybe you don't think foreigners rock, but back then it was rock music. And, uh, you know, I think my first album was Aerosmith Rocks, and then I had some Kiss, and then we had some other things, but but I, I liked Foreigner. And uh, a child of the 70s and 80s. It's boomer rock, right? Boomer rock, yeah, yeah, boomer rock, right. And so I lent my Foreigner album to Lucky Rodriguez at Notre Dame, and he never gave it back. But it was a physical analog album. So I lost. And so electronic music came along, not dance music, but electronic version, MP3s. So now I could make a copy of Forner and give it to Lucky. And I keep my analog. He didn't care if it's a copy or the original. It still works. But who cared? The music industry. Because they want him to buy his own analog album or electronic version. And make a long story short, Napster, right? How do you kill it? Well, you arrest the CEO, you blow up the server, end of Napster. So then digital comes along, and now everybody gets music, but you pay for it. 
because it's traceable and trackable and it's unique. And so with money, it took a long time to solve that double spend problem. But once it was solved, the aha moment now that we, we have is we can have any asset, anything of value will eventually be tokenized in the digital space. And if you go back to commerce, again, in the old days, if we wanted to transact stock transaction, we would bring analog things to the buttonwood tree in New York. I would bring a physical piece of paper money. You'd bring a physical piece of paper, a stock certificate. We'd meet under the tree and we'd exchange. The problem is if you've seen the movie Gangs in New York, that was very dangerous because the guys with the top hats would come beat you up and, and take your stuff. So they moved it inside and created the exchange and, and now you could come in and, and, and be safe and transact. But it was better when someone said, well, you know what? The paper can get lost and get stolen. It could rain. How about we put all the paper in Texas called DTCC and we create QCIPs, electronic alphanumeric codes. And now we trade those and we don't even have to be in the same room. We can do it over a computer and be anywhere in the world and trade these QCIPs. Now, the problem is it's still centralized. It's still a broker that has to do that. And we still have the physical piece of paper. And DTCC, DTCC processes $1.2 quadrillion a year. It's owned by the banks. It's like a you know, mutual. That's, in, that's inefficient. The digital age says we don't need any of that stuff. We can have a digital, permanent, immutable, encrypted record of ownership of anything. That's all a token is, it's just a line item in a database. But it's permanent, it's immutable, it's encrypted. And all of that will say that digital property rights, everything that can be owned, will be owned in digital form. Everything that can be transacted will transact in digital form. It doesn't mean we won't have physical things, we will, but the ownership of them or the identity of them like, I have a physical driver's license. I won't have that in the future. I won't have a digital identification. And, you know, silly little stuff like why – I'll use my daughter. So when my daughter goes to a bar. She wants to get in. The bouncer says, I need to see your ID. You don't need to know where she lives. All you need to know is she is 21. It's all you need to know. That is easy to do with digital technology. He doesn't need to know where she lives because what if he reads where she lives and follows her home? As a dad, I don't, I don't want that, right? I, like I kind of get pissy about when I go to a hotel. I'm like, let me see your ID. I'm like, no, you know, you have to. Right? Well, no, I, I don't, but, but okay. Um, you don't need to know where I live. You don't need to know my driver's license number. You just need to know that I am me. And digital ID would, would be better for that. Totally agree. Um, so at what point did you realize that Bitcoin was, was its own asset class? Mm. It's not like the rest of the cryptos. Because yeah. you talk about crypto in public, people are like, oh, that's FTX, that's Sam Bankman fried it's all a scam. Yep. Right? So yep. how do you separate the two and yeah. un it's help people enough. understand? Good, good question. So look, at the root of all of this is blockchain. Blockchain is, is the tech, right? And blockchain technology is this next iteration of, of computing power. It's an operating system for the internet of value. So mainframes run on COBOL and Fortran. You know, the, the Spark workstations ran on, on Spark or, or Unix. Uh, and then we uh, had the personal computer, DOS and Windows. Then we had uh, the internet runs on TCP IP. Then we have the mobile net, iOS and Android. And now we're gonna have blockchains. So blockchain is thing. So, so Bitcoin was the first use case of a blockchain. And the reason it's a separate asset class is it's essentially digital gold, right? It's a scarce asset because it has a finite supply. And the stock to flow ratio is about equivalent to gold, right? The amount of gold that's mined every year is about equal to what's lost or stolen. So the stock to flow ratio is very high. Same thing with Bitcoin. The amount that's lost or stolen roughly equals the new. And so the stock to flow is, is very consistent. Scarce assets have value. And look, for 5,000 years, gold has been the standard of value. One ounce buys a fine person's suit for 5,000 years, from Cleopatra's time to a zoot suit in, in the 20s to Savile Row today. And same thing is the problem with gold, if I have a bar, 
it's really hard to break it in half and give you half of it. It's even harder to stuff it in that computer and send it to my wife. So with Bitcoin, I have all the benefits of gold, but it's portable and divisible. I can divide it down to eight decimal points to one Satoshi, and they're you know, 2.1 quadrillion Satoshis. That's why my hashtag 2.1 quadrillion in my, my Twitter handle. But Bitcoin is digital gold. It's an asset class like gold unto itself. Other applications of blockchain technology, Ethereum, Monero, Dash, um, you know, myriad others, uh, there's some question as to, well, are any of them currencies, cryptocurrencies? It was a cryptocurrency, a store of value or medium of exchange. Some can make that case. Some of the privacy coins could probably make that case. Ethereum, I don't really think of it as money, right? It's more of a toolkit. Then you have thousands of other tokens that are just utility tokens. Most of those have no value, right? Most of those are, they're not scams in the sense of like penny stock scams. They're, well, some of them are, but, but mostly they're just not very useful. Dogecoin, right? it's no use. It's, it's a meme. The meme is the message. I'm like, well, look, the fact that people own it does create value. They converted something into it, fiat, maybe into ETH, maybe into that, whatever. So yes, it, it has value, but it only has value because someone else wants to exchange it with you. But if you go to sell it and there's no one to buy it, the value will go down. Um, unlike if you have a protocol like Uniswap, where you can take a piece of every transaction, maybe that does create value. So at the end, value comes from cash flow, ownership, uh, you can either be an, a, an owner or a loaner, and equity or, or debt, uh, or, or generate cash flow. So it's a long-winded way of saying, I think about the world of, of Bitcoin as digital gold, as eventually being potentially the payment rail for all money. That's a long way off, but, but I think it could be. And the, the, the question I can't answer yet is if you think about the internet, right? There were 80 protocols. Now we have five. What happened to the others? Well, they just weren't used. They just went away. Um, TCP IP became the base layer. So internet protocol at the base, and then TCP IP really runs everything. On top of that, you have FTP that moves files. You got HTTPS for websites. You got SMTP for email. And then you got www. that kind of ties it all together, what Tim Berners-Lee wrote. And that's the stack. Okay, well, let's use that model. Bitcoin, kind of like TCP IP. Ethereum, kind of like www.doc. Filecoin, clearly like FTP. In the middle, Cosmos, Polkadot, I don't know, Avalanche, Layer Solana. Yeah. Yeah. So, something's going to be the HTTPS and the SMTP. I don't know. Okay. Or is it one chain to rule all chains. Bitcoin, Lightning, L3, L4, don't need all the others. Maybe, maybe. Or is it a bunch of L1s and bridges and interconnectivity? That one's tougher because it seems like there's too many attack vectors and too many weakness points. But, you know, there's something to be said for development on an L1, creating an ecosystem. And, and look, the law of increasing returns, Paul Romer won the Nobel Prize for this, saying it's not the best technology that wins. It's the technology that gets critical mass first. And there are lots of examples of inferior tech becoming, you know, the tech. And so he says, well, why isn't Bitcoin just MySpace? Because of benchmark capital and because of Red Hat. MySpace had proprietary tech. The Winklevoss twins created this thing. Zuck stole it and said, I'm going to have better tech. Okay. It gets displaced. MySpace goes away. In the open source world, Bitcoin, really good. You invent something better. It's open source. I copy paste. Taproot. Segwit. We can add on to make things better. And... That was the beauty of Red Hat, is this open source world allows 
a technology to iterate and become better. And so I think it is the chain to rule all chains. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be other chains and other use cases. I'm still pretty bullish on Ethereum, and uh, I'm bullish on a few other projects. But I definitely believe Bitcoin is an asset class, and it should be in everyone's portfolio. Not the whole portfolio, but everyone needs to have it. And, and the reason is the way you build a portfolio, and Markowitz, again, won the Nobel Prize for this, is you take assets that are uncorrelated, that are risky, meaning they have volatility, and you combine them, right? The riskiest asset you could ever own is cash. Now, it's the safest in the short run, but over the long run, it's the riskiest because you're going to get chewed up by inflation and you're going to lose purchasing power. So what do you do? You take bonds, which have a risk of default, and you add them to cash, and your risk goes down because now you have a better portfolio because they're uncorrelated. Well, then you add stocks, and the risk goes down. You add hedge funds, the risk goes down. You add venture capital, the risk goes down. You add Bitcoin, the risk goes down, not up. People are like, no, it's so volatile. Who cares? Amazon and Bitcoin have the same volatility, 80%, 8-0. Amazon has been a public company 27 years, just had their 27th birthday. They've had a double-digit drawdown every single year, including this year. Went down 22% this year. Okay, Every single year, double-digit, average 31%. On average, you lose a third of your money every year. Five times more than 50, twice more than 90. When was the right time to sell? That would be never. Who bought it? The IPO and held for 27 years. There's only five people, Jeff, mom, dad, ex-wife, and Bill Miller. Bill Miller's cost is seven cents. Man. But he's held it the whole time because he understands value. He understands technology. He, and, and Bill's great, and his son is great, and is a big Bitcoiner. And so it's just with them down at Bitcoin Miami. And what people don't understand is the reason no one complains about owning Amazon is hindsight bias. Well, it, it was successful. Well, Bitcoin is the best performing asset of all assets, 11 out of the last 14 years, including this year. <laughs> People are like, no, that's not true. It's just math. Um, hashtag just math. And over the whole period, it's not close. Now, the first four years, nah, I don't really count them. It was a science experiment. We weren't sure it was going to work. We weren't sure if we could get critical mass. You know, to go from fractions of a penny to a dollar, let's take that out. But the last decade, that counts. And over that last decade, it crushes everything else. And it's 0.0, .0 correlated to bonds and 0.15 correlated to stocks. So when you add it to a portfolio, your portfolio becomes more efficient and better. And had you put 1% in five years ago, you would have had 250 basis points per year better performance with less risk. How can you not have that? I don't know. I love how you call Bitcoin schmuck insurance. <laughs> That's something that always cracks me up every time you say it. Okay, Mark, final question. You're in an elevator with a stranger. You got 45 seconds to orange pill them. What do you say? Ah, uh, well, I would say two things. One, think of Bitcoin as an operating system for the internet of value, okay? Think of blockchain technology as an operating system, no different than iOS and Android or DOS and Windows. And think of Bitcoin as a diversifying asset, the same way you would gold or hedge funds or venture capital or real estate that's uncorrelated to stocks and bonds and will make your portfolio more efficient. And finally, we know the great fortunes come from embracing new technologies. This is simply a new technology. It's an evolution of computing power, no different than the internet, no different than mainframe computing, no different than the PC. And every time you invest in one of those big trends, it works out great. I love it. Well, Mark, I know we both got businesses around, so I'll let you get back to it. Um, can we have you back on after the having? Oh, when, for that's, sure. Oh, yeah, that'll be fun. That's when the fireworks yeah, yeah, are going to start. That's when the fireworks right? will start. We'll be uh, we'll be uh, on the verge of of crypto fall. And look, one of the interesting things about about the having is 
it's it's one of the mad genius things about about Bitcoin. One one mad genius was the limited supply, and and it's really interesting. I can never figure out why twenty one million. And this this young girl, a friend of mine's daughter, said, "Well, it's easy, right? Executive order sixty one o two was issued on four five thirty three. So April fifth, nineteen thirty three, the U.S. government made it illegal for citizens to own gold. Well, why did they do that? Because they wanted to devalue the currency to get out of debt. Um, and it's not a coincidence that Satoshi Nakamoto's birthday is 4575. Because 75 was when they reversed Executive Order 6102 and made gold legal again. So it's interesting. And it's no surprise that January 3rd, 2009, right at the peak of the uh, global financial crisis, uh, it was the release of Bitcoin. And that the first image on Bitcoin is a picture of the London Times Chancellor on the second uh, bailout for banks, on the brink of the second bailout for banks. I actually have a pair of socks that has the you know, uh, Genesis block on it. Um, but she said, well, 6102, 21 and six zeros. Mind blown. Crazy. But crazy. But, but what the halving does that's just so amazing is every four years, you cut the block rewards, meaning every 10 minutes, uh, there's a block that's created. And the miners, it's a very unfortunate term because it implies digging and, and it's not. It's, it's, a, it's a data center. So you buy a bunch of computers in the old days and you plug them in and you go find customers like Amazon or Azure to pay you to use your CPUs, servers. Well, now you buy GPUs and ASICs and you plug them in and you don't need to find customers. You get an algorithm. And you secure the network through cryptographic security, and you get paid a block reward for providing that computing power. And ingenious system, but the real genius was every four years you cut the block rewards in half. Well, why is that genius? It incites motion. Because if you think about it, cost of electricity is fixed, cost of rent is fixed, so your data center would suddenly be unprofitable unless the price rises. Well, why do you want the price to rise? Because you want the people to see it, right? Hunter-gatherers, we're going to go hunt things that move. And so what you get is this boom, and then unfortunately excess, and then bust. But that cycle of increasing the interest as the price moves every four years uh, increases the market cap and increases the participation in the network because networks grow exponentially based on the number of participants according to Metcalf's law. And so what's really cool about it is, you know, the first went from one to 10 and then from 10 to 100, then from 100 to 1,000, then 1,000 to 10,000. So 10,000 was the last halving. And we got to 20, right? And then we fell all the way down. Well, the next halving is uh, 100,000. Now, 100,000 means we probably get, so we add a zero. So we get 10 times bigger in, in the, the, the market and uh, the value of the network. And so my guess is we'll probably go materially higher than 100 um, before we settle back down to fair value. But if you want to know the fair value of the network, just look at the Metcalf's Law Curve, and it'll tell you. And it says we should be at about 100,000 sometime uh, in 2024. Yeah, and now we got presidential candidates talking about Bitcoin. Which on, is amazing. On Bitcoin Miami stage, right? Exactly. You could have never predicted that, that last having, right? So No way. And look, all custom begins with broken precedent. And what is considered conventional wisdom eventually fades and it gets replaced. That's how science works. <laughs> is, uh, you know, we replace the old with the new because we, we learn new things. And and technology is iterative. And this, this, it's inevitable that everything will migrate to blockchains. It is inevitable that the $7 trillion that's spent on the trust industry, the banking industry, finance industry, brokerage industry, will eventually be replaced with truth. And that 68% of GDP will be redeployed to better use cases. And that's very exciting. But it's hard if you're one of the people being displaced or being disrupted you don't want that to happen. But eventually it works out. You know, it's interesting. Everyone always complains, you know, AI is going to kill all the jobs or technology is going to kill all the jobs. Technology always kills jobs. But here's a factoid. We have more jobs on the planet today than any time in history. 
despite all the jobs that were killed by technology. We should have different jobs. Companies that didn't exist because new technology evolves. Human ingenuity is the most amazing thing. Human creativity, the ability to overcome, the ability to innovate, and that will continue. And yes, people who were paid to write, you know, you know, routine blog posts, yeah, ChatGPT can probably do that better. It certainly can't do a lot of things well. <laughs> We've seen all the errors that it makes. But it's a pretty interesting technology, and it'll just play some jobs. But then those people will go do cool stuff. Um, I'll leave you with one last story on that. So in the 94 recession, this guy got laid off. And uh, he was working at Bell Labs. And he said, hey, can I take my project with me? And I'm like, yeah, whatever. We don't even know what dense wave multiplexing is. Knock yourself out. And uh, so he takes the project. He goes all up and down Silicon Valley to try to get funded. And everyone's like, dense wave multiplexing? What the hell is that? Uh, no, no. Well, what dense wave multiplexing is, is take fiber optic cable, shine white light, carries a certain amount of data. He said, oh, I'm going to shine the light through a prism, eight colors, eight times as much data. People are like, that'll never work. Works. And he can actually do it 256 different colors. Um, no one would back him. His retired third grade teacher in Philadelphia gave him 300K to start the company. And it turned out it worked. And turned into a little company called Sienna, which is worth hundreds of millions of dollars, actually billions of dollars. And uh, that teacher's investment went from 300K to 300 million. I love that. Now, it was probably ill advised for her to give him her life, sa to, for her to give him his, her life savings, but it worked out. So, so it's cool. But he didn't give up. He was displaced. He lost his job, but he was creative in. Uh, innovative and and the world's better because of dense wave multiplexing and it's better because of blockchains and it's better because of Bitcoin and it's better because of all the innovation that will come on top of this. Awesome. Well, Mark, I can't thank you enough for coming on. I could talk to you all day about this stuff, but we have limited time, yeah, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah, gotta get back to work. Um, so let's get let's do this again after the halving. This, yeah. That's when the fireworks we'll it. start. It'll be great. We'll do it.